Blasting from 1945 to 1991, the Cold War was one of the most dangerous periods in human history. For nearly five decades, East and West stood locked in an ever-escalating nuclear arms race, fingers poised on the buttons that would unleash global Armageddon. In such a tense atmosphere, even minor errors could prove disastrous, and on numerous occasions, humanity came dangerously close to wiping itself out. From alert systems mistaking clouds or the moon for incoming missiles, to a training tape being accidentally inserted into a defense computer, the causes of these near misses are as terrifying as they are absurd, underscoring how truly lucky we are to have survived the 20th century without a global nuclear conflict. One of the closest calls humanity has ever faced took place a full four years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, revealing that while the Cold War may be over, the threat of nuclear annihilation is still very much with us. This is the story of the 1995 Norwegian rocket incident. Just before we get back to Simon discussing yet another way humans recently tried to destroy ourselves and stop it, 1995 was recent, I'll be accepting no further input on this matter. But you know who won't try to destroy humanity? Today's sponsor Squarespace, aka the platform that lets you build an online presence without need for a technical existential crisis. But if you've been thinking about turning your knowledge into something real, whether it's an online course, a tutoring biz, or just a place to house your passion project of trying to figure out if I'm an AI version of Frodo Baggins, Squarespace makes that jump insanely easy and quick. You start with Blueprint, Squarespace's AI website builder. You answer a few simple questions and it kicks out a site layout that looks super snazzy. From there, it's drag, drop, and clickety-click if you want further customization and done. Want to monetize your content? You can set up member-only areas, sell access to your lessons or videos, or even put special content behind a paywall. One-time payment or subscriptions, it's all built in. No sacrificing your firstborn to the web gods in order to get your menu bar to menu bar, it just works. And you're not launching blind, their analytics show you what's working, where people are clicking, and where they're ghosting, so you can tweak your site without guessing. Bottom line, Squarespace gives you pro-level tools without the pro-level headaches and makes it insanely easy for anyone to launch a fully featured website, no tech savvy required. Head to squarespace.com forward slash brain food for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use offer code brain food to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Now let's get back to Simon talking about how humans really need to rethink our decision-making paradigm. In the early morning hours of January the 25th, 1995, operators of the Missile Alert Warning System, or MORS radar station in Olenogorsk, Russia, detected a small, fast-moving object rising from the northern coast of Norway. As the operators watched, the object sailed in a high arc over the Barents Sea. The size and trajectory of the object matched that of an American Trident II submarine-launched ballistic missile, and it was headed straight for Moscow. While the launch of a single missile was unusual, after all, a preemptive strike should have involved dozens of missiles, there was a possible explanation. The missile was set to detonate in the upper atmosphere, generating an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP, that would blind Russian defenses to the coming all-out attack. Alternatively, it could have been aimed at the Russian nuclear submarine base at Mamansk on the Kola Peninsula. With less than 10 minutes left until the missile reached Moscow, the operators at Olenogorsk sounded the alert. Using a special terminal code named Crocus, the duty general entered the data from the radar into Kavkaz, the complex network of cables, radio relays, and satellites at the heart of Russia's nuclear command and control network. In Moscow, Russian President Boris Yeltsin, Defense Minister Pavel Grachev, and Chief of the General Staff Mikhail Kolosniko uh, were pulled aside and handed the Cheget, the briefcase-sized transmitter that controls Russia's nuclear arsenal. Following a well-rehearsed procedure, the three men opened and activated their briefcases and prepared to launch a retaliatory strike. Though Yeltsin nominally had sole legal authority to authorize a launch, the other two, as well as the army general staff, could assume this responsibility if he became incapacitated. Meanwhile, the missile had broken up into four sections, the telltale signature of multiple independent re-entry vehicles or MIRVs. Unlike the United States, Russia follows a launch-on-warning doctrine, meaning a retaliatory strike can be launched as soon as enemy missiles are detected. This prevents a preemptive strike from destroying Russia's ability to launch a counter-strike, preserving the doctrine of mutually assured destruction. Yet Yeltsin hesitated. For four long minutes, he kept his military commanders in agonizing suspense, waiting to see how the situation unfolded. This would prove a wise decision, for eight minutes after the alert was sounded, the object veered from its Moscow-bound trajectory and crashed into the Arctic Ocean. The alert was called off, and the strategic nuclear forces stood down. 
Hours later, the Russians learned what the mysterious object was. It was a Black Brandt 12 rocket launched by Norwegian and American scientists from the Andoya rocket range in northeast Norway. Developed by Bristol Aerospace in Winnipeg, Canada, the Black Brandt is one of the world's most successful sounding rockets, a type of small research vehicle used for studying the upper atmosphere and outer space. Since 1959, over a thousand Black Brands have been launched by Canada, the United States, Norway, and other countries, and have contributed to dozens of scientific breakthroughs, such as determining the cause of the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights. The latest iteration of the system, the Black Brandt 12, can reach altitudes of over 1,500 kilometers, higher than the orbit of the International Space Station. Unfortunately for Russia and the rest of the world, the separation of the rocket's four stages appears on radar very much like a missile releasing multiple warheads. Even worse, the Norwegian rocket's trajectory happened to coincide with an air and space corridor used by American Minutemen intercontinental ballistic missiles en route from their silos in the American Midwest to Russia. So, what went wrong? Why did Norway not warn Russia of the Black Brandt launch? Well, actually they did. One month earlier, on December 21, 1994, the Norwegian Foreign Ministry sent a routine message to neighboring countries, including Russia, announcing an impending launch between January 15th and February 10th, depending on weather conditions. Somehow, however, the message got lost in Russian bureaucracy and never made it to the Moore's radar operators. This simple oversight was all it took to bring the world to the brink of nuclear annihilation. Or was it? Though the Norwegian rocket incident is widely cited as one of the closest calls in the history of nuclear weapons, some deny that the world was ever really in any real danger. According to Vladimir Dvorkin, director of Russia's fourth Central Research Institute, President Yeltsin was fully aware that the rogue radar contact was not a threat. For in addition to ground-based radars, Russia maintains a fleet of early warning satellites codenamed OKO, which would have indicated that the Norwegian rocket was not a nuclear missile. Yeltsin would thus have never authorized a full-scale retaliatory attack. Quote, It's very difficult to make a decision, maybe even impossible, for civilized leaders. Even when a warning system gives you a signal about a massive attack, no one is ever going to make a decision. Even an irrational leader alarms that one missile has been fired. I think this is an empty alarm. End quote. Indeed, when Yeltsin appeared before the media the day after the incident and announced he had activated the Shegit, many dismissed the claim as a show of bravado meant to distract the Russian people from the ever-worsening war in Chechnya. But others, like Moore's expert Nikolai Devyanin, disagree, arguing that multiple factors led the radar operators and Russian government to treat the Norwegian rocket as a very real threat. Less than a decade before, in 1987, Russia's confidence in its own defenses was severely shaken when Matthias Rust, a German teenager, flew a light aircraft over the border and landed in the middle of Red Square. Wishing to avoid a repeat of this humiliation, the Soviet and later Russian military leadership placed Moors and other defense system technicians on perpetual high alert. This led to a toxic environment of overwork, as Russian journalist Oleg Falachev explained, quoting him, At times, the officers who perform alert duty are so exhausted at the end of a shift that they don't feel either their hands or their feet. According to Devinen, this high-stress environment, coupled with internal politics, made the outcome all but inevitable, quoting again, There was not time to ask their superiors for advice, but they did not want to become scapegoats for another Mathias Rust. In this situation, the duty officers made the sole possible decision to work according to plan, as prescribed by instructions, and as has been practiced dozens of times in drill sessions. And even if Vladimir Dvorkin is correct, and Yeltsin did not actually take the alert seriously, the Norwegian rocket incident nonetheless exposed serious flaws in Russia's nuclear command and control system, which, if left unaddressed, could lead to further, potentially more serious incidents. For instance, the launch on alert doctrine, while ideally suited to the Cold War regime of mutually assured destruction, significantly increases the risks of false alarms escalating out of control. In addition, Russia's missile alert radar system is dangerously fragmented and dilapidated. During the Soviet period, most of Russia's missile warning radars were located in its satellite states such as Ukraine, Latvia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Azerbaijan. But when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, many of these radars suddenly fell out of Moscow's control. While Russia managed to broker agreements with several newly independent nations to continue operating their radars, other sites were demolished by their new owners, leaving large gaps in Russia's defensive network. For instance, Russia is almost entirely blind to missile attacks launched from Asia and the Pacific. Worse still, what does remain of the system is old, poorly maintained, and prone to malfunctioning. As retired Soviet Colonel Robert Baikov revealed, 
Even in my period of service, the equipment ceased functioning properly on more than one occasion, or certain parts of it spontaneously went into combat mode. Uh, you can imagine what is happening now. So, although the notification protocols for peaceful rocket launches have since been updated, so long as the flaws in the Russian nuclear command and control system remain uncorrected, another Norwegian rocket incident is entirely possible. With the fate of the world then in the hands of the leaders in charge in Russia, and how they decide to react to it. And now how about a bonus fact? Speaking of the men in charge and how they react to a tense situation perhaps ruling the fate of the world, this all brings us to that time one man, Vasily Arkhipov, quite literally saved the world only to see his superiors more or less tell him they wished he died rather than do what he did to save the world from nuclear annihilation. In May of 1962, Soviet President Nikita Khrushchev and Cuban President Fidel Castro reached a secret agreement that allowed the Soviets to start building missile sites in Cuba, including stocking them with nuclear missiles, 42 of them in fact. It should be noted here that the US at this time had nuclear missiles in Turkey and Italy that could hit Moscow within 16 minutes of being launched. On the flip side, the Soviets had plenty of nukes pointed at and perfectly capable of destroying the US's allies throughout Europe. However, the Soviets did not have nearly the capability to destroy targets in the United States itself. Certainly, they had enough nukes to destroy all the major cities in the US and more, but they were lacking in reliable intercontinental ballistic missiles to adequately function as a mutual destruction deterrent. Indeed, there were some among the US brass that felt the loss of allies throughout Europe and the lesser direct casualties from long-range nukes that managed to hit their targets in the United States were acceptable losses given the payoff would be the annihilation of the Soviet Union and the end of the threat to the United States. So if the Soviet Union had nukes in Cuba, that tipped the balance in the Cold War back to near even, rather than in the United States' favor as before. In the fall of 1962, the United States sent a US U-2 aircraft to fly over Cuba in an attempt to confirm the rumors that they had heard about the Soviet missile sites in Cuba. On October the 14th, 1962, the U-2 arrived back with pictures of these missile sites. A day later, the pictures were presented to President Kennedy. Tensions rose and alarms were sounded. We now know that the Soviet Union, not content with Dr. Castro's oath of fealty, not content with the destruction of Cuban independence, not content with the extension of Soviet power into the Western Hemisphere, not content with a challenge to the inter-American system and to the United Nations Charter, has decided to transform Cuba into a base for communist aggression, into a base for putting all of the Americas under the nuclear gun. The United States' answer to what Adlai Stevenson termed Soviet blackmail in Cuba was a quarantine of all offensive weapons being shipped from Russia to that island fortress. The U.S. threw up a steel fence prepared to stop any vessel carrying materials of war. And thus, on October the 15th, 1962, the 13-day ordeal that became known as the Cuban Missile Crisis began. This brings us to the man of the hour, Vasily Arkhipov. Arkhipov was born on January the 30th, 1926, to a poor peasant family near Moscow. At the age of 16, he began his education at the Pacific Higher Naval School. Vasily saw his first military action as a minesweeper in the Pacific Theater at the tail end of World War II. In 1947, he graduated from the Caspian Higher Naval School and served on submarines in the Soviet Black Sea, Northern, and Baltic fleets. In 1961, Vasily got his first taste of crisis management in an incident that, while extremely momentous, wasn't even close to what he'd help with later. This first incident happened when Vasily was appointed deputy commander of the new K-19 sub, known today as the Widowmaker, thanks to the 2002 movie K-19, The Widowmaker, but in its day nicknamed by the Russians Hiroshima. This sub was one of the first Soviet nuclear submarines which was also equipped with a nuclear ballistic missile. On July the 4th, 1961, as the sub was conducting exercises near Greenland, a major leak was discovered in the radiant cooling system. Since no backup cooling system was installed pre-sale, the reactor on the sub was in real danger of a nuclear meltdown. In order to prevent a nuclear accident unlike any the world had ever seen before, the captain of the sub sent workers into high radiation areas to build a cooling system on the spot. 
every single member of the sub did what they could to prevent disaster, including Vasily lending his engineering expertise to help contain the overheating reactor. The crew succeeded, but not before these workers and many on the crew developed radiation sickness. Every worker that was sent as first responders into the high radiation areas died within days. Due to this, a mutiny nearly erupted on board the K-19 sub. In this case, Vasily backed his captain in continuing the work and was eventually awarded the Medal for Bravery in Time of Crisis and Loyalty to the Soviet Union. All of this was a precursor to the day Vasily Arkhipov saved the world. After his time on the K-19 sub, Vasily was made second command on the B-59, one of four attack submarines that was ordered to travel to Cuba on October the 1st, 1962. The sub contained 22 torpedoes, one of which was nuclear, holding approximately the same yield as the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. The captains of each of the four subs were given permission to fire their nuclear torpedoes at their own discretion, so long as they had the backing of the political officer on board. Unknown to the crew of the B-59, the United States began their naval blockade of Cuba on October the 24th and informed the Soviets that they would be dropping practice depth charge, think warning shots, to force subs to surface and be identified. Moscow could not communicate this information to the B-59 due to it being too deep underwater to receive radio transmissions. And so it was that on October the 27th, 1962, U.S. destroyers and the aircraft carrier USS Randolph located the sub trapped it, and began dropping depth charges to force it to surface. The sub's crew, which had been traveling for nearly four weeks with very little communication with Moscow, was very tired and not aware of the circumstances. The sub's captain, Valentin Savitsky, believed that nuclear war had already broken out between the Soviet Union and the U.S. and wanted to fire the nuclear torpedo. The political officer concurred, all that was normally needed to launch. Fortunately, particularly given the heightened tensions at the time, in this case, one other person had veto power over firing besides the captain and the political officer, the second in command, Vasily Arkhipov. You see, Vasily, despite being second in command on the B-59, was the leader of the fleet of the four Soviet subs sent. Had Vasily not been present, nuclear war would have likely happened as both the captain and the political officer wanted to launch the nuclear torpedo and would otherwise have been able to. However, Vasily vehemently disagreed, arguing that since no orders had come from Moscow for many days, such a drastic action was ill-advised and the sub should surface to contact Moscow to assess the situation. A heated argument broke out. Legend, probably false, says punches were thrown. Eventually, though, Vasily won the day. His reputation as a hero in the K-19 mutiny reportedly helped in the debate and the sub finally surfaced. Upon surfacing, they were met by their American enemies and instructed to head back to Russia. They obliged, nuclear war was averted. Vasily Arkhipov was a hero once again. When the sub arrived back in Russia, however, the crew of the B-59 were met with trepidation. After all, they had pretty much surrendered to the Americans. Said one Russian admiral to Vasily, it would have been better if you'd gone down with your ship. Despite the not-so-hero's welcome he originally received from the Soviets upon his return, Vasily continued serving in the Soviet Navy and ultimately, in 1975, was promoted to rear admiral. Later, he would become the head of the Kirov Naval Academy. He retired in the mid-1980s and passed away in 1999 at the age of 73 as a result of complications due to radiation poisoning from back aboard the K-19. Despite few in the wider world having ever heard of him or ever giving him any credit at all, at least one person recognized the significance of what Vasily had done on the 27th of October 1962, his wife, Olga Vasily, who always recognized him as the man who saved the world, stating, The man who prevented a nuclear war was a Russian submariner. His name was Vasily Arkhipov. I was proud and I am proud of my husband always.